Well, good morning. It is great to see you today. Beautiful day outside, and so glad that you are able to be here with us this morning and uh, join us in worship. So uh, it's a great day, beautiful day to be in God's house. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, before we do anything else, I want to remind you that there are uh, out in the foyer there are bulletins if you want to grab those and uh, take a look at what is going on. Uh, just give you a real hint: there's not a lot going on because of all the, everything else going on, but. Uh, just keep you up on the news of what is happening within, within the church. But before we do anything else, I want you to, now that Stoller is here this morning, we can go ahead and start. We were waiting for Stoller to get here, and so Stoller is here, so we can go ahead and start now. But uh, if you would just stand, and everybody turn around quick and just wave at Stoller since he just got here, but then wave at somebody else this morning. Welcome with to somebody.
In Psalm 101, we find these words from King David. I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. We praise God this morning because we can, because we can gather here together. Isn't this neat? It, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, yeah, I, I hope I never take this for granted again, the fact that we can be here together, worshiping the Lord together. And uh, for those of you that are joining us online, we're glad that you're joining us as well. As we come into this time of prayer this morning, um, I just ask that uh, we be in prayer for our nation uh, during this time for all that's taking place. Uh, as far as prayer requests from our church family goes, uh, Sonny Kelly is asking for prayer for her family. They've uh, lost several loved ones the last few months, and so keep her family in your prayers in these days for God's comfort and, and peace to be uh, upon them uh, during this time. So um, I know there's many requests that we can mention this morning, and uh, while we're not going to have an altar call time this morning, I would just ask, uh, even where you're at this morning, if you want to take a posture of prayer as we pray together, uh, for those that are joining us online, I want to share prayer requests uh, through, the, through the Facebook Live thread as well, but let's just spend some time in prayer this morning as we come before the Lord. Let's, let us pray. Father God, we thank you that we can come before you in prayer. We thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you're not far off, but God, you're near. God, we thank you that you have saved us and called us to a purpose. And God, I just pray for every individual, for every family represented here this morning. God, you meet us right where we're at this morning. God, uh, in our time of need, in our God, uh, and our greatest longings, God, you know, God, you know the challenges, you know the struggles, you know those that are, God, in the midst of grieving, God, you know that those are, uh, God, battling uh, physical challenges, God, you know, God, those that are, God, uh, hurting in other ways, God, maybe, uh, maybe financially, maybe because of lost jobs, maybe because of uncertainty, maybe because of, God, relationships, God, whatever the case may be, God, meet us here, meet us now. God, wherever we're at, God, you know. And God, for our nation, God, we pray this morning. God, for the, uh, for the pandemic and God, all the challenges, God, that uh, God, continue to, uh, God, to be encountered. God, for the unrest that's taking place. God, uh, the need for justice. God, for God, so, many, so many different situations, so many different circumstances. And yet, God, we know, God, that you are in all. So, God, we pray, God, that you would have your way. And, God, may we as your people, God, uh, as your church here in this community place, this, God, may we rise up and be the church you've called us to be. God, we pray, God, even this week, as we encounter those who, who do not know you, that are far from you, God, uh, that we would, we would reflect your light and your truth to those around us. So, God, this morning, we again thank you. And, God, we pray that as we continue to worship you, God, uh, and, and, and just in the, in the hearing of your word, God, that Pastor Lyle is going to be sharing to us uh, momentarily. God, we just pray that you would have your way in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, and uh, God, as we go about our week this coming week. So God, we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Well, good morning. Are you happy today? Yes. What's that old song? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> all right, all right. Yes, yes, yes. Anybody thankful for anything this morning? Anything at all? Health. Health. Okay. Good weather. Good weather. Yes. Freedom. Freedom. I saw some of you spend the day at the lake yesterday. That was a good thing. Anybody else grateful for anything this morning? What's it, what was that? Your mom bought cereal. Praise the Lord. Any certain type of cereal? Cinnamon toast crunch. We need to pray for the kale household, the kale household, that they continue to have cinnamon toast crunch. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, it is great to see you this morning. So glad 
that you are here. I hope that you've had a great week. You know, it's, it doesn't seem possible that we find ourselves at the halfway point of 2020. And uh, it seems like it just got started, but at the same time, I told my discipleship group last week as I was meeting with them, I'd love to go back to January 1st and just hit the reset button. But uh, I'm afraid I'd end up like that grind, Groundhog Day movie and it just would repeat the same thing over and over and over again. Well, I do want to let you know that we are progressing with our plans to open the church back up fully on July 5th. Our plan is that we will begin holding Sunday school classes that morning at 9.30, the usual time, 9.30 to 10.15. And then we'd have worship beginning at 10.30. But in order to do that, we need to check with all of the teachers uh, and to find out if they're comfortable coming back. So Pat is checking with all the children's ministry teachers that uh, have taught before this COVID thing started, making sure that they are comfortable coming back to teaching again. Pastor Wayne's doing the same thing with the adult teachers. And so we'll continue uh, to keep you updated on that. We will continue to live stream our services. And then we'll also have them uploaded to YouTube later on that day. So that will not change, except that we are in the process of upgrading uh, all of our equipment. So those who are going to be watching us uh, online, hopefully you'll notice a, a huge difference in uh, the product that you are receiving in your home. We'll continue to deliver DVDs to those who are not able to connect with us through online avenues. And so we're going to continue to do that. But there may be a few minor changes as we meet together that you might see as we continue to try and keep everyone safe from the illness. Uh, praying that they'll be able to find a cure and then we can just go back to the way it was and not have any issues at all. But it's great to see you back this morning. It's great to see people back in the sanctuary and uh, looking forward to the day when everyone is back feeling comfortable and safe and are being able to, to join us all together. Well, these first six months of 2020, I probably don't need to tell you this, but have been very difficult months. Uh, I guess I'll become a little transparent and tell you that since March, I have leaned against God pretty hard to receive wisdom and direction on how to preach, what to say, when to say, and what not to say. I've also, I've always sought guidance on what to preach, but since March there's been so much going on in our world that it would be extremely easy to allow the pulpit to become a political pulpit. And I have no political aspirations, and I've always said that I do not want the pulpit to be a place where political oratory is preached from or given to, and so I hold tight to that. So with everything else going on around the world today, there are times that that I feel torn, torn by my calling to, to give people hope and, and peace and comfort and encouragement in days like this, but also not to give the, the indication that I have my head buried in the sand concerning what's going on in the world today. So I've been praying, Lord, what do you want desire me to say? What do you want me to give your people each and every week? And this past week, my discipleship group met again, and we started going through the book of Isaiah. Last week, a good pastor friend of mine posted that he felt as pastors that we should not become so political in our messages, but instead address the problems of the world through God's word instead. And those two things combined with God's nudging have brought me to the message this morning. And as I began to read the first chapters of Isaiah, I thought to myself, this is exactly where we find ourselves as a nation today. We are a nation in crisis. And we're eager to put the blame and the responsibility on somebody else, but Isaiah gives us a little different look at that, and we're going to see that this morning. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. Isaiah's name means Yahweh is salvation. There were a number of Old Testament prophets, and, and each one was used by God to bring a message to the people from God, and each one of those prophets delivered their message in various ways. But as I began to read the opening chapters of Isaiah, he reminds me, Isaiah reminds me of one of those bold, tell it like it is, no sugarcoating type of prophets. He comes out with both barrels blazing right out of the gate. And this is the way, he says this is the way it is, like it or not. And you might guess that most people did not particularly care for his message of that day. And I feel that the same message in our world today might be, able, might be received in the same way. Dr. Tony Evans said this week in a recorded message, he said, don't try to change the nation unless you can allow God to change your heart. I want you to hear that again because it's true. Don't 
think that you can change the nation unless you allow God to change your heart. So any change that we desire to take place has to begin with us. We can't blame it on somebody else. We can't say you fix it. No, it has to begin with us. If we want to see our nation healed, then we need to revisit these verses from Isaiah and get to the root of the issue. There are two different scripture passages that I would like for us to look at this morning. Obviously, we're going to be looking at Isaiah 1, chapter two through, or verses 2 through 9. But before we get to that point, I want us to look at a passage from Deuteronomy. So if you have your scriptures with you this morning, your Bibles with you this morning, or whatever you use to read the Bible, if you want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. In this passage from Deuteronomy, we find the children of Israel getting close to crossing over into the promised land. Moses was still alive, so it was before Joshua took over. And God comes to his people and he makes them an offer. And it was an offer that you would have thought that they could not refuse. Now I'm going to be reading both of the passages, or all the passages today, from the New Living Testament. So if it's, it's a little different than what your translation is, that's why. But that's where I'm reading from this morning. So Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting in verse 15. Now listen. Today I am giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commands, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you are about to enter and occupy. But if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, and if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a long life, good life in the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life, so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God comes to Moses and says, hey Moses, you know, come here. You got a couple minutes, just come here a minute. I want, I, want to, I want to tell you something. I want to let you know that I want you to tell the children of Israel. I want you to tell them these things. So Moses tells the children that they have a choice. And they get to choose what they want. Remember that they've been wandering around in the desert for 40 years. God had been taking care of them. God made sure they had everything they needed to eat and give them all the care they need. But they've been wandering around out there in the desert for 40 years. And God says, you can either have life or death, prosperity or disaster. What do you choose? <laughs> life and prosperity, please. So then God says, fine. I'll give you life and prosperity. All you have to do is love me, keep my commands, keep my decrees, keep my regulations, and you do this by walking with me. And when you do that, I will bless you in the land that you are about to enter. But if you turn your heart from me and refuse to listen and follow other gods, you'll be destroyed. But once again, God comes and says, it's your choice. You, you decide what you want to do. Well, the people at that time made the right choice. They said, we want to choose life and prosperity. We're going to follow you. We're going to, we're going to follow after you. We're going to follow your decrees and all these things. And God says, okay, okay. Now, fast forward to Isaiah and the vision that he received and the message that he was to deliver. We're now in a time where the people had forsaken the Lord, and as a result, were spiritually and morally sick. They were in crisis. They had rebelled, deserted the Lord. They were 
there were consequences for not such an ungrateful attitude and disrespectful actions. And Isaiah details Judah's situation in God's sight and calls them to return to a covenant relationship with God. Everything in their world was turned upside down. There was no calm. There was no joy. There was hatred instead of love. There was unrest instead of peace. The northern kingdom had already fallen. The southern kingdom of Judah was hanging on by a thread. And Isaiah has this vision and steps up and begins to address them. And there are two insights that I want to bring out to us this morning as we look at these verses in Isaiah 1, 2 through 9. And the first one is this, the tragedy of rebellious children. Now, we're not speaking about children of a young age, how they rebel against their parents and all those other things. We're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about those children who were created by God, God's children, all of us, because we were all created in his image. So we're talking about the rebellion of all of God's children, not just a certain age. And this is what he says, starting in verse two. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, earth, this is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. No nation in human history had ever experienced so many acts of kindness and care that, that Israel had. God had found the nation in bondage, had delivered them out of that bondage from their Egyptian masters, made a covenant with them, had given them a land flowing with milk and honey. And through these continuous acts of kindness, God made a great and exalted nation in which he set upon his hopes of worship and witness. But despite his benefits and without the least expression of gratitude, both Israel and Judah had rebelled against God. Heaven and earth were called to witness and be reminded of that passage in time from Deuteronomy. You remember that time when Moses and God met? You might remember that passage where God says, he says, now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. God through Isaiah is reminding the people that they had made a covenant with God. It was witnessed by heaven. They had chosen life and prosperity and vowed to love the Lord and keep his decrees. But that was not happening. So Isaiah was called upon to remind them of the reason that they were suffering. Verse 2 gets to the heart of the crisis. God's family had broken with him. Judah's rebellion was not simply the rebellion of a nation against a God. It was a rebellion against a father. You see, the Hebrew word meaning rebel is actually P-A, pa, which was used in treaties to speak of a, of a subordinate country's disobedience to the covenant made with the protected nation. And the reaction of the people was not what Isaiah really expected. In fact, Isaiah said that the domesticated ox and donkey who lacked the capacity to reason demonstrated a greater sense of acknowledgement and appreciation than did God's children. Israel upon, you know, in, in the Bible times, in the Bible times, a donkey was known for its stupidity. An ox was, was submissive to its owner, dependent upon it for its sustenance. And like the ox and the donkey, Israel had a master upon whom she was dependent and to whom she owed her obedience. But unlike them, they would not recognize and would not serve God. Therefore, to say Israel was less knowledgeable than those domestic animals was, was a pretty strong statement. Strong statement of her disobedience and, and her defiance. In fact, he's saying that these animals were more aware of their owners and the source of, of who took care of them and who watched after them than God's people. These animals were aware of the hand that fed them where the children of Judah could care less. Animals do sometimes seem to have more sense than people. Have you ever noticed that? Because of their alertness to natural phenomena, there have been times that animals have helped avoid disasters. In northeastern China, officials were able to warn and evacuate people from high-risk areas hours before a killer earthquake struck. 
They were alerted to the disasters by cattle that mooed more than usual and chickens that refused to roost. In Japan, 20 small quakes within a small amount of time were accurately forecast because observers noted that catfish swam frantically as being chased by sharks. So sometimes animals have more sense than people have. And from the prophet Isaiah, we learned that observing animals can teach us how to prevent a ruined life. He noted that an ox knows its owner, a donkey knows where its food comes from. And these people, these animals know who takes care of them. God's people, however, however, often have forgotten who their owner or creator is. Hundreds of years after Isaiah, the apostle prophet Paul reminded the Corinthian church that they were not their own. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, he says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. We need to take a lesson from the animals and remember who our owner and provider and creator is. We need to live wholeheartedly for them. Live so that others know who we belong to. The land of Judah was in crisis because they had become rebellious children. They had forgotten who created them, who had provided for them, who had blessed them, who had protected them. And they chose not to follow the covenant that had been made, so their land was in crisis. Sound familiar? So the thing, first thing we notice is the tragedy of rebellious children. The second thing we notice is the result of denying God. You know, when you're rebellious, there are results. There are consequences. All of us probably suffered through that as children. At times growing up, we did something our parents said not to do. And we might have ended up with a swat on the behind or whatever. But there are consequences to what we do. In verse 4, it says this. Oh, what a sinful nation they are, loaded down with the burden of guilt. They are evil people, corrupt children who have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Isaiah seems to be describing what only he can see. He was witnessing the sinful nation. Their abandonment of God had caused them to be crooked in their dealings, to pervert what was good and promote what was evil. To cause people to be so drawn to things that are so wicked and sinful, believing that it is their right to do so. To move away from any semblance of morality into an acceptance of any form of evil possible. And these reactions revealed that the nation had not just neutrally ignored God, but that they had actively forsaken God for their own wicked practices. And in doing so, the people had spurned and abandoned God. And in choosing their sinful ways, they had abandoned their only hope of, of help. Their rebellion was seen in that they had turned their way backwards. Rather than moving towards God, they were moving away from Him at an unbelievable risk. Their deliberately defiant attitude against God is indicated in the word forsaken, or spurned, or turned their backs. The title of Holy One of Israel is used by Isaiah 25 times with 12 occurrences in chapters 1 through 39 and then 13 through verse chapters 40 through 66. And it's almost peculiar to Isaiah. He's about the only one who ever used it. In fact, that phrase is only found twice elsewhere within Scripture. And the title appropriately contrasts the people's sin with God's holiness. In verses 5 and 6, we find these words. It says, why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured and your heart is sick. You're battered from head to foot, covered with bruises, welts, and infected wounds, without any soothing ointment or bandages. No people, redeemed or otherwise, can flaunt themselves in the face of God and expect to be exempt from punishment. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, it speaks of the blessings of being obedient to God. But it also speaks of the curses of disobedience. For any of those who say that they don't understand why our world is in the shape that it is, I would encourage you to read that chapter sometime. 
when the people of Judah turn their backs on God, certain consequences follow. And the very choice of sin over the will of God most inevitably resulted in retribution. And Isaiah recounted what was happening to them and to help them understand that their difficult times had come because of their disobedience. Not anyone else's, but their disobedience. The word picture in verse 5 is not the picture of a sick man, but instead it is a picture of a man who has been beat within an inch of his life. There has been no action to try to heal the wounds of, or treat them, but instead it's almost as if they were asking for more. And while the condition of the man is evident, there was no action to bring about a healing. Our country and our world is in trouble just like this man. Where we see sickness and brokenness all around us. We see a people who have been beaten by the effects of sin. And instead of trying to bring healing to those wounds, we continue to ask for more punishment by our actions. And we can make a long list of the things that are bringing about pain and suffering in our land. And each one of them would be considered wounds. And Isaiah described the problems of ancient Judah and called them wounds as well. He saw them rooted in the nation's rejection of God. Can the root of our problem be the same? Yes, it can. Just like Israel, our only hope is to return to God. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders that they would return to God and live by standards rooted in God's nature. Verses 16 and 17 address the issue this way. In verse 1 it says, Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Verses 7 and 8 indicate that the country had been brought into this condition because God had sent enemies against them because of their rebellion and sin. Where it says your country lies in ruins and your towns are burned. Foreigners plunder your fields before your eyes and destroy everything they see. Beautiful Jerusalem stands abandoned like a watchman's shelter in a vineyard, like a lean-to in a cucumber field after the harvest, like a helpless city under siege. In these passages, when Isaiah speaks of these untreated wounds, he is primarily speaking of the spiritual condition of the people and the nation. But he is also speaking of their military condition as well, because Judah had been attacked by numerous countries. They had been attacked from every side by different enemies, and they were losing some of their territory to foreign nations. And through all this, they should have seen, but they did not, that this was taking place because of their spiritual condition. They were suffering because of their rebellion and turning away from God. In Isaiah 8, in verse 8, Isaiah pictures the inhabitants as being like a shelter in a vineyard or a cucumber field. And the shelters were used by watchmen who were looking over the fields to keep them safe from thieves. Isaiah, along with everything else that he saw, saw that there were still a few watchmen keeping watch over Judah as to keep the thieves away. And these watchmen were the remnant that continued to follow God and worship Him. And Isaiah closes this thought with this verse in chapter nine, in verse nine, where it says, "If the Lord of Heaven's armies had not spared a few of us, we would have been wiped out like Sodom, destroyed like Gomorrah." Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities that God completely destroyed because of their great wickedness and their examples of God's judgment against sin. Judah would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah, totally devastated if it had not been for a small remnant that remained faithful against all of those who had given in to sin and turned away from the covenant with God. And I read these verses from Isaiah, and I believe that we as a world, we as a nation, are in the same situation. There is a remnant that is left that is saving the world. Those who call themselves Christians, those who follow God, those who worship Him, are that remnant. They're the ones who are in those shacks, those places watching over. Those are the ones who, who are praying for our country, who are asking God to be gracious to our country, to, to bring healing to our country. 
The only way to bring a healing to our land is through our returning to God. By their actions, they had broken their moral and spiritual covenant with God. By breaking their agreement, they were bringing God's punishment upon themselves. God had given them prosperity, but they refused to acknowledge that it came from him. God then sent warnings, but they refused to listen to him. And then finally, God broke the fire of his judgment. As long as the people of Judah continued to sin, they cut themselves off from God's help and isolated themselves. When you feel lonely and separate from God, remember that God does not abandon you. It is our sin, it is us who cut us off from God. And the only cure for this kind of loneliness is to restore a meaningful relationship with God by confessing your sins and obeying Him and following Him and trusting Him. Trusting His instructions and communicating with Him regularly. Is there hope for our world today? I believe there is. I believe there is because of what we read in Isaiah. We notice that in Isaiah chapter 38, verses 17, we see that King Hezekiah gives praise to God for his healing and the kingdom was restored. But it took an act of coming back to God by a leader and saying, I am going to follow God and this, the country was restored. I believe that there that it was only through our repentance and forgiveness of God that our wounds will be healed. And I believe our country can be healed. I don't believe it's a lost cause. I believe it can be healed. But I also believe that it has to start with us coming back to God and returning to God and saying, Lord, we need you. We need you. We need you to heal us first. Heal us of all the things that are within sight of us that are causing all the unrest. And then, Lord, as you heal us, may you heal the rest of our country. God will heal if we ask. We are the remnant. We are the ones who are saying, Lord, we want to pray for our country. You know, we can, we can look at the things going on in our world today, and we can, we can begin to say, you know, our world is lost, and, but our world is not lost. What has been lost is that we're not praying for our country like we should be. We are not praying for that restoration of, of, of problems. We're not praying for that, that evil of, in the world that, to be gone. We are not praying that, that uh, we would take away all the injustices that are going on in the world. But when we pray to God and ask Him to take over, we return to Him. God will heal our land, and I believe that He will. So for us this morning, I want us to be encouraged that while our world may mimic what was going on in Isaiah's time, there is hope of a healing. But it begins with each one of us. You can't look at the person beside you and say, it begins with you. You have to look within yourself and say, it begins with me. That's where the change has to begin. If we want our land healed, if we want our world back, if we want all the sin that's going on in the, in the herd and the unrest to be gone, it has to begin with us. In a moment, the team is going to come and they're going to lead us in some songs as we close this morning. The first one they're going to lead us in is called Breaking the Chains or Break the Chains. We've been talking about the world and how evil takes effect and, and it's for all of us myself included sometimes the evilness of the world can just come into us and it can cause our minds and our thoughts to be different than what they should be and we need to ask god to break those chains with inside of us those things that are causing our minds to to be different than god's mind because if the world is going to be changed, we need to be thinking like God. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we allow the evilness of the world to seep in and to, to cause our minds and, and our thoughts and our actions to be a part of the problem. And so as we close this morning and, and they sing this song and then there's others to come, I'm just asking that you take this time to, to sing but I'm asking that you take this time to reflect. 
If there are things in your life right now that are holding you bondage, things that are causing your mind or your actions to be where they shouldn't be, I'm asking you to say, Lord, break that chain within me. Help me to be free from that. Help me to, to be as you want me to be. Help me to know, Lord, that, that I am free of all of that and open to what you would lead me to do. So as they lead us this morning, wherever you're standing, if you, if, if you get to a point where God is, is speaking to you and you feel like you just need to sit down and you pray and pray, then you sit down and pray. If you feel that you just need to kneel, I encourage you to kneel. But whatever posture of prayer that God asks you to take, I encourage you to take that and ask him to break the, break the chains that are causing our nation to be in the shape that it's in, or causing our own lives to be in the shape that they're in. We need to return to God. And the only way we can do that is by breaking the chains, asking him to break the chains that are holding us back. So I would invite you to stand. I invite you to just sing and worship and ask God to speak to you this morning and ask him to help us break those chains.
Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this very powerful reminder to us this morning, God, that you are, that you are in the business of breaking chains. God, that you are in the business of, God, uh, breaking those bonds that, that hold us so tightly. God, for those here this morning, God, uh, God, we know indeed that you've spoken to us. And God, I pray, God, uh, that you would indeed, God, continue to break chains. God, there's those here this morning God, that uh, God are still holding on, God, uh, to, to, to maybe to things or to struggles or to challenges or, God, to, uh, to sin. God, they're just, God, those chains need broken. And so, God, this morning, have your way. Have your way in us. God, don't let us leave here this morning. Don't let us leave here still holding on to things. Don't let us still leave here, God, with lives unchanged. Don't let us leave here. God, still carrying those chains. So, God, we entrust all of these things to you this morning. God, we pray that you would only continue to have your way in our lives and in this place. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This, uh, this is the part of the service where we uh, uh, would normally worship the Lord in, in the collection of our tithes and offerings, uh, in, the, in the collection of those that are giving. And uh, at the close of the service, you're still going to have the opportunity to do that. We have the, uh, the boxes in the back. So as you exit the sanctuary this morning in just a few moments, uh, we invite you to do that. We also invite you to um, uh, tear off that back left of the communicator and uh, drop, uh, drop those uh, back there as well. Any prayer requests or praises that you, that you might have, we want to we wanna continue to pray for each other. Um, this week. And uh, another reminder, those that are joining us on the thread and joining us online, share those prayer requests with us because we definitely will be praying for those uh, this coming week. So thank you as always for your continued faithfulness as, as a church, and your giving, and your stewardship. We couldn't do all that we do without that. So we thank you so much for your faithfulness. In fact, this afternoon, um, we have an opportunity. Uh, the Cole family is hosting a uh, cookout for the youth group this afternoon uh, from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. 1431 Stockdale. There we go. Okay. And uh, so today at 5 o'clock, we're encouraging the, the teens to join us for that. I know a lot of the teens are, are going to be there. And uh, we're looking forward, to, looking forward to that. So any students that are entering 7th through 12th grade are, are welcome to join us for that as well as the students that graduated this last year. So um, let's now pray over the tithes and offerings before we continue on in worship this morning. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together. We thank you for the privilege of coming before you. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. God, in, in song and reading your word and, and hearing, God, uh, the message, God, uh, the powerful message and, and reminder that, uh, God, that you, you desire all of us. And so, God, this morning, God, we pray, God, uh, as we prepare to go out uh, this week, that you would indeed continue to speak to us. And, God, we pray your blessing, God, this morning over the gift and giver. Tithes and offerings are, are, are collected. At the close of the service, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Oh 
Lord, we come to you today, and we realize, Lord, that our nation is in trouble right now. But Lord, we also realize that you are with the remnant. You are watching over the remnant. And so, Lord, I pray that as we leave today, that we would not be filled with, with gloom, but, Lord, that we would be encouraged because you are with us. And, Lord, you encourage us. And, Lord, that you will help us every step of the way. And, Lord, you will use this remnant to bring healing through you to this nation. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to be that praying remnant watching over the field before us. And, Lord, that you give us your direction and your guidance, and your help, and your mercy, and your grace. And Lord, we just ask that you would just help us this day. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for all the unrest that's going on. We pray for everything, Lord. And we just ask for you to be glorified once again. We ask, Lord, that we would return to that covenant that was made years ago and give everything we have to you. It is you, Lord, who has created us. And it is you, Lord, we, we find our joy and happiness in. So fill us with that today. Lord, watch over us as we leave today. Just protect us, Lord. Just continue to, to guide us. Continue to help us, Lord, to draw closer to you as we leave today. And we ask all of these things. In the precious name of Jesus and all of God's children said, Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Have a wonderful week. God bless.